It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. This organization was founded in 1972, and I'm going to tell you about some things that happened in 1971. Now, I was 10 years old when those things happened. But in 1971, Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard, the sort of kind of barely gold standard that we have. Now, I also want to tell you a little bit about my history with Eagle Forum. My father drug me around. He was the Oklahoma director for the Freeman Institute in the 70s, and he drug me around, and I had to listen to Dr. W. Cleon Scowls and teach the Constitution probably a hundred times, and it finally sunk in. And in 1980, he hosted, think of this event, Oklahoma was a hundred percent Democrat state. In 1980, he hosted Phyllis Schlafly, Cleon Skousen, and Jerry Falwell. And from that moment forward, uh, Oklahoma became a 100% Republican state. Can you imagine the change with information? Anyway, I'm, I'm going to walk through pirate money, and I'm going to do it rather quickly. I set my timer here so I know how much time. Uh, I'm going to do it rather quickly, so I apologize for the fire hose, but you can literally get a copy of the book. And if you can't give me $10, I only take cash. No central bank digital currency, no Venmo, no PayPal. I only take cash. But if you can't do it, take one of these books. Take one. Take three or four. I don't want to go home with any of them. Just get the word out. That's my purpose here. So we're in an economic war. We're actually in three economic wars. There's a foreign war. Uh, with China primarily. There's a domestic war in America, which is ESG and so forth, but the key one is the economic war of the heart. And when I say that, it's because we in America have made money our purpose and our goal, and when you do that, you lose the economic war of the heart because Jesus said where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our money should not be our treasure, but we've made it our treasure. And if we want to win any of these battles, immigration or any, they all have a monetary component. And if we want to win them, we have to realize that money is designed to protect us. It is not our job to protect money. I'm in the investment man management industry, and I have been for 40 years. And everybody comes up and tells me, hey, Kevin, how do I protect my money? What a foolish question. That's as foolish as someone coming up to me. I live in Texas. We're a gun state. We love our guns. Somebody comes up and says, how do I protect my gun? No, the gun's supposed to protect you. <laughs> and the money should protect you and the liberty you have and the security you have and the values you have. When people start to worry about protecting your money, you know who they are? They're the third servant who got the one talent and they said, I'm going to bury it to protect it. The one cast out. Jesus said in Luke 16, 11, he said, if you're not faithful with your unrighteous mammon, you will never be trusted with true riches. We've got to get the money part right. It is not the goal. It is not what we protect. It is what we must use to protect our, our nation, our families, and our future. So anyway, I'm going to tell you not about that. That's my next book, The Economic War of the Heart, and I'll tell you about how King Josiah discovered this lesson because it's really important, but I don't have time for that today. What I'm going to ta tell you about is the foreign war, the domestic war, and then what you can do about it, what our founders gave you that you could do about it. There's a foreign stated goal to displace the United States dollar. Vladimir Putin started it in 2008 publicly saying we've got to remove the dollar as the reserve currency of the world. I was noticing this. I was hired by the Pentagon to research it. I found out that the 2008 stock market crash was a part of his plan to tear down the economy of the country so that we would elect Barack Obama. I wrote that in my first book, Secret Weapon, and it happened. It was financial terrorism. But you know, at that time, our total reported federal debt was only $10 trillion only. At the time, I thought that was astronomical. Now I look back on the good old days of just $10 trillion in debt. You know, the Chinese had 17% of that debt, $1.7 trillion. And I said, hey, we're in an economic war with China. And they looked at me in the Pentagon, and they said, you're crazy. They're our banker. They would never want to see us hurt. They'd never do anything to harm America. But you know what? In 2008, they did not join in with Putin to attack the dollar. They chose not to because they had that much of our debt. But in 2013, when Xi Jinping, the last time, by the way, did you know our government is shut down now? We're shut down. It was just announced. So breathe a sigh of relief. 
In 2013, when we shut down the government, I remember Ted Cruz, my senator, got up and read Green Eggs and Ham on the Senate floor. But you know what? And then we only had $16.7 trillion in debt, but Xi Jinping came to power and he said, we must de-Americanize the world. We're going to de-dollarize the world. Their real goal is to bankrupt us. That's their purpose. And you know what? We're making it easy for them. I put this chart together because I had to have my slides turned in by September 15th, and it shows only $32.9 trillion in debt. Oh, that's ancient history. It's $33.1 trillion now, just in a few weeks. Not only that, did you know? Did you know that that $31.8 trillion figure down there was April? I put it in the book Pirate Money. April, we owed $31.8 trillion. Now we owe $33.1, $1.3 trillion in debt since April. Five months. We're making it easy for them. Now, what's happening? Did you know mortgage rates are over 7%? U.S. government bonds are paying 5%. So what happens if you apply an increased interest rate with a massive increase in debt? You have much higher interest payments. A few years ago, when Trump left office, we had $378 billion was what we paid that year for interest. Very soon, we will be paying 5% of $33 trillion, which is $1.65 trillion. Do you know the entire total income tax receipts of every person in America, not FICA, not Social Security, but income tax receipts, it's about $2.4 trillion. And two-thirds of that will go out in interest only. Everyone in this room I see, I saw some children here earlier that didn't count, but everyone in this room I see probably lived through a period when we had 10% federal interest rates. At 10% federal interest rates, that's $3.3 trillion. We will have $50 trillion of debt before this decade is out. That is unfortunately the fact, and that's why we're making it easy for them to destroy the dollar. So, President Biden's solution is Biden Bucks, Executive Order 14067. He put out and says, this is the responsible development of digital assets. And everyone that mined Bitcoin and everyone that owned cryptocurrencies cheered. They finally recognized us. But when you read the order, you'll realize that he intends to bring a central bank digital currency we've nicknamed Biden Bucks, and he intends to use it to control every aspect of your life. It's all about control. And in fact, when you read the order, it talks about diversity, equity, and inclusion and the importance of ESG, environment, social, and governance. That's what it's about. It's about eliminating fossil fuels. It's about mandating electric vehicles. It's about controlling you. And if you say the wrong thing, maybe you say what Riley Gaines said and said that a man is not a woman, they can take your money away from you for hate speech. Think I'm crazy? Well, PayPal said that's exactly what they're going to do, and they're not even a government. This is what we're facing. ESG investing, debanking, deplatforming, silencing citizens. You see this guy right here? He's a good friend of mine. He wrote the foreword to pirate money. His name is Nick Vojcic. He's the most sympathetic individual on the planet. He goes around to high schools and tells kids, hey, you have a reason to live. Why? Because when he was in high school, he wanted to kill himself. He has no arms and no legs. He said, I'll never find a wife or have a family or get a job or be able to do anything. And a janitor came up and shared Jesus with him and said, God has a plan for your life. And if you pray and ask God into your heart, you can have a beautiful life. Now, he's spoken to millions of people around the world. He's got a beautiful wife. He's got kids and he's a wonderful human being. And yet one day after speaking at a pro-life event uh, for uh, the Crisis Pregnancy Center of Santa Barbara, after that, his bank called him in and said, we're canceling your account. Well, why? Am I on a terror watch list? They said, no. When he researched it deeply enough, he found someone up higher in the bank decided that because he was pro-life, he didn't deserve to have a bank account. What's coming soon is the mark of the beast. You saw the, the Canadian finance minister say, if you supported Trump and the Canadian truckers, you lose your bank account. This is not conspiracy theory. They're putting it flat out in your face. And coming soon is central bank digital currency. It's also known as programmable money. Not my words, but their words. When the Fed wrote a paper on it, they said, isn't it exciting? We can program money. If we want the economy to speed up, all we have to do is say your money is only good for 90 days. It's like a coupon that expires. 
If we want to slow things down, they say your money's not good until 30 days from now. If they want to control behavior, and I kid you not, at the G20, a woman goes on television who's attending G20, and she says, I'm so excited about this because... I can imagine when I have this currency and I go into the coffee shop to buy a cup of coffee in the afternoon, they can tell me, I'm sorry, ma'am, you've already had two cups of coffee today. That's more than you need. Your money won't pay for that. You'll have to have decaf. Can you believe that? No, that's impossible. Remember Mayor Bloomberg in New York? Your soda size is maximum 16 ounce. That is the intention. They want to put all of you under their control using central bank digital currency. They'll tell you who can buy. If you said the wrong thing, you can't buy. What you're allowed to buy. If you have a gasoline power car, you only get 10 gallons of gasoline a month. Beyond that, you can't buy any more. When you can buy, how, where you can buy, why you can buy and how you can buy. If you're outside the zip code and we want to lock you down, your money won't work outside of that little zip code you live in. And they're bragging that they'll be able to do this. So here's the G20 meeting. They just had it. That was in September, this month. And there's the paper from the Financial Stability Board. Financial Stability. Okay, they released their paper September 7th, they've set the stage for coordinated central bank digital currency, which can monitor, tax, regulate. Your account would be restricted if you don't get the latest booster. They call this a digital panopticon, which translates digital prison. With CBDC, it's not your money. You have a use license permission to the money. It belongs to the central bank. Now, I have a Federal Reserve note right here. By the way, they claim this is money. What this is is an, a promissory note that functions as money because Congress gave them authority to function in money. I'm not certain it's entirely constitutional, but let's just face the reality. This is what people count of as money today. They want to eliminate this. Why? Because it has privacy and because there's a certain cost in ink and paper to produce lots and lots of it, so they'd rather just digitally create it. But it's a central bank uh, Federal Reserve note. It has privacy, but with CBDC, everything's monitored, and they have a line item veto on your spending. And it will be legal because you will agree to it in the terms of service, or you won't get it. And if this goes away, you have no options. I'm going to show you an option. Now, why do we call this an economic war? Because the Great Reset is being brought to you by the World Economic Forum. It's always all about the money and that's the sin of america because we follow along being led by the nose because we have to have our money we have to protect our money so our solution and by the way economic war room that's where we came up with the idea of the border you all cheered for that we every week we have a solution for a problem we here's a problem the the bad here's the good the solution and here's the beautiful we try to take people to jesus if you haven't watched Economic War Room, you can watch it for free if you're not a Blaze subscriber, economicwarroom.com. I want to ask you to help me spread the word to promote awareness about the problems that we're facing, whether it's ESG or, or whatever. And so you need to watch the show to get that. And here's the, the biggest and best solution I think we've come up with is pirate money, the founder's hidden plan for economic justice and defeating the Great Reset. You know, John Paul Jones, this was in, do you ever read Bill Federer, American Bennett? Mm -hmm. Last week, Bill Federer's American Bennett had a picture. He, he had this after me. I put this in my slide deck before it came out because I, I can <laughs> document that. But he had that picture of John Paul Jones. It's a British caricature of him. And to this day, the, the Royal Navy declares him an American pirate. Did you know the pirates helped us win the Revolutionary War? Did you know the pirates helped us win the War of 1812? And it was pirate money that our founders said was real money. Now, why do I say pirate money? That's People say, why do I say that? I will get to it. I will explain because it will make sense to you. But before I get there, let me ask, what is money? Money is three things. It's a unit of account, a medium of exchange, and a store of value. It has to be all three to actually be money. This is not a very good store of value, by the way. The biblical view is money is gold and silver and sometimes copper. And the founders' view was that money was gold doubloons and silver pieces of eight. What do you think of when I say those? 
Pirate money, exactly. So the future of money, what is that? Is it Bitcoin? Is it central bank digital currencies? Is it an IMF basket or a BRICS replacement? Is it a digital yuan? I hope none of the above, although I could live with Bitcoin, none of the others. Let me give you a brief history of money. First, the colonial days. I have here, and I'll take this to my book table, I have, this is a 1776 printed in Philadelphia, continental note, $4. It's payable to the bearer in four Spanish milled dollars or the value thereof in gold or silver. Spanish milled dollars, a.k.a. pieces of eight. Why do they call them pieces of eight? Because you could cut them in eight pie-shaped wedges, and each one was a bit, Two bits made a quarter. Four quarters made a dollar. Those were pieces of eight, piezas de ocho, or Spanish milled dollars. Now, the problem with this is the Continental Congress had nothing to back it up. They had less than 1% backing. So you said, I want my gold and silver. Ah, come back and see me Tuesday, <laughs> just like Wimpy. The idea here, though, is that they had unbacked paper money and so you heard the phrase, not worth a continental, not worth a continental. Washington said that a wagon full of continentals would not buy a wagon load of supplies. But somehow, through God's grace, we got through the Revolutionary War. Now, in the Articles of Confederation, they continued the concept of unbacked paper money. And so they asked a student, why did the Articles of Confederation fail? There are a whole lot of reasons. One of them was that we did not have a common currency. Every state was producing their own money, and nothing was backed, or it was at varying degrees of being backed. So constitutional money, it's a dollar. The term dollar comes from the Spanish milled dollar. It's not a British term. It's not an American term. It's a Spanish term. It means a piece of eight. In other words, pirate money. And the Constitution is very specific. It says only gold and silver coin, Article 1, Section 10. But it's key. It says no bills of credit, which means like this is a bill of credit, meaning I'm going to take this into the Federal Reserve and get something for it. You know what? You can take this in right now. You can. It is backed by something. You can take it into the Federal Reserve, and they will give you two tens for it, <laughs> or four fives, or 21s, or a bunch of change. You know, our founders, when they wrote the Constitution, they hated paper money. I've got all the quotes in Pirate Money, the book. Jefferson said, paper is poverty. Okay, in the 19th century, states said, it's kind of hard carrying around, and I've got here one-eighth of a gold doubloon and a full piece of eight. This is called a half a scudo in gold. It's kind of hard to lug around that. So we need a better solution. And so in Kentucky and other states, they created essentially warehouse receipts. This is a Bank of Kentucky note from 1837, 12 and a half cent warehouse receipt, meaning one of those eight pieces. And you could take, take this in to Kentucky and they would give you one of the eight pieces. And it was a warehouse receipt. It was real money. It was deemed real money by the Supreme Court in 1837 because a guy named Briscoe said, well, you can't admit bills of credit and that's unconstitutional. So he borrowed a bunch of it, unconstitutional money, spent it, and then he sued Kentucky. And he said, that's unconstitutional money, thinking it would be declared worthless and he wouldn't have anything to pay back. But the Supreme Court ruled, no, it is valuable and it is backed by gold or silver and therefore it is legal tender. And the state can admit that. Now, we had legal tender uh, backed by something up until the Civil War when the Union started issuing greenbacks and the Confederates issued Confederate money, neither of which were backed by anything. And that, after the war, is found to be unconstitutional. In the landmark Supreme Court decision where Catherine Hepburn beat uh, Clark Griswold. No, it is literally called Hepburn versus Griswold. I don't get laughs with young people. They don't know who Clark Griswold was, and they don't know who Catherine Hepburn was. If Riley were here, she would look dumbfounded and say, I'm not eating till 6. But the rest of us can eat at 4.45. <laughs> the Supreme Court ruled it entirely unconstitutional to, back, to issue unbacked paper money. And Ulysses S. Grant, the Republican, the good war hero Republican that he was, decided to pack the court, and in 1871, Knox versus Lee overturned that decision to much of our detriment. 
And so now the, the government is allowed to issue unbacked paper money. But they turned away from it, uh, and they decided to back money with gold, which they did. And a guy named L. Frank Baum wrote a book called The Wonderful Wizard of Ounce. I know, you think it's Oz, don't you? But it's O-Z, it's Ounce. And it actually was a populist fairy tale, an allegory about money. And you think about it, what was the name of the city? The Emerald City, meaning greenbacks. And in the Emerald City, when you went behind the curtain, what was there in power to show for it? Nothing. And how's the, how do you get out of the pro problem that you have, Dorothy? You walk down the yellow brick road with your silver slippers. MGM changed them to uh, ruby. That was an actual economic allegory. And the Wicked Witch was the Northeastern bankers, the Ten Man as factory workers, the Scarecrow as farmers, the Cowardly Lion was William Jennings Bryan. Let me at him. Let's have, don't crucify me on a cross of gold. The Munchkins were citizens, and Toto represented the teetotalers, because that's what teetotalers were called, totos. Now, in the 20th century, we unfortunately got away from that. We created Federal Reserve notes starting in 1913. By the way, the Federal Reserve was established on Jekyll Island, you probably know this, at the home of John D. Rockefeller in his drawing room that was at the pinnacle of Indian Mount, and Indian Mount was a mount on which the eight-foot-tall natives sacrificed babies. That is the birthplace of the Federal Reserve. 1933, we eliminated any gold backing for individuals. You couldn't take your Federal Reserve in and get the gold that you used to be able to get because FDR confiscated the gold. But we had silver certificates, which Nixon ended in 1971 when he ended any semblance of a gold or silver standard. It was a temporary order from 1971 to the present. A Hershey bar that costs a dime now costs $2. A comic book that costs 15 cents costs $3.50 today. A Slurpee that costs 20 cents now runs a dollar. And then cheeseburger, fries, and a chocolate shake. All of those. Now, why did I put this? Because in 1971, that's all money was mattered to me. I could buy those things with it. I was 10 years old. I cut my parents' lawn for $1.60, and I, I could spend $1.45 and save 15 cents. That is what, you know, that costs right now about $14 for that same basket. This is what we've done since we've left the gold standard. And now we have PayPal, Venmo, tap to pay, Bitcoin, all of that, cashless future. You know, paper money fails. It fails miserably. $100 trillion from a reserve bank of Zimbabwe. CBDC doesn't have privacy. Bitcoin's not very stable. Gold and silver are a terrible unit of account. It's really hard to take that gold coin right there and shave off just enough to buy coffee downstairs. They don't want gold flex, and I don't want to shave it off, and I don't know how to measure it. So what does work? Pirate money. It's constitutional. It's biblical. It's desirable, and it's an excellent store of value. In the year 1923, you could buy a good man's suit for one ounce of gold. I can buy this suit, this shirt, this tie, and shoes, everything to make a nice wardrobe with $2,000. Gold has held its value, but so is silver. Did you know that 100 years ago you could buy five gallons of gasoline for 10 dimes? And today you can do the same thing if the 10 dimes are silver dimes created before 1964 just from the silver content. Silver content in 10 dimes is about $25. That'll buy you five gallons of gasoline in every state but California. Now, we also need economic justice. Gold and silver hold their value, but they're not easy to use. It's not accessible. Rich people can own them. How to buy gold was the number one Google search term in April. So how do you buy gold? Here's the quote from that. Bitcoin shares common qualities with gold. Both are mine. Neither is wallet friendly, and they're virtually useless for buying gas, groceries, or a movie ticket. Not only that, they're taxes collectibles. Nobody knows how to do. What do you do with gold? You store it in the ground. You put it in a vault. You don't spend it. You don't use it in any way. That's the problem with it, is it goes back to the economic war. The hard issue, it's like you're burying your money. It doesn't produce anything or do anything. All right, here are the key issues. It has to be biblical, constitutional, practical, desirable, necessary, and achievable. 
And pirate money can do that because Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution says no state make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. A later Supreme Court decision, oh, that was approved in the Briscoe versus Bank of Kentucky I told you about. You can make certificates, and then you add to that Bronson versus Rhodes, 1868, and they said, did you know that bullion or coin is identical in the eyes of the United States government? And therefore, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the Texas Bullion Depository or any depository in your state that you can establish, and we're going to let people deposit gold and silver there, and then we're going to give them an electronic means to transact in that if they want, or you can show up and get your gold and silver out, or you can write checks on it. But we'll start transacting in ounces rather than dollars. And if we do that, we can have pirate money that the federal government has no interest in. They cannot tax, and according to Supreme Court decisions, they cannot stop a state from issuing it. All of this is explained in detail in this book, Pirate Money. It is how we beat the Great Reset, because the Great Reset depends on you adopting central bank digital currency to give them the money they need to enforce it on you. Gold and silver are taxed as commodities, even if a state declares them legal tender, like Utah did, and, and I was there. I'm in the picture with Ken, or I'm not in the picture, but Ken Ivory's in a picture with a Utah uh, coin act. I don't know if you were there at the time. Are you in that picture? Uh, the governor is signing into law, but you know what? The IRS says that's not functional money, and therefore it's not legal tender, and therefore if you buy it and the value of silver goes up, you owe a tax if you ever spend it. But transactional gold and silver, it's all proven in the book. If it's transactional and functions as money, it is not taxable under the IRS code, the Constitution, Supreme Court rulings, completely exempt. This is the monetary solution. And if we don't do it, we're going to end up with the mark of the beast, which is we won't be able to buy or sell without using their currency. So where are we? Well, right now, uh, Texas is being, Governor Abbott's being approached with this to put it on special session. I have 13 states. It's actually now 15 states, but I'm going to say 13 because it sounds like the colony's super cool. But 15 states have said, I want to do this. Ken Ivory, your colleague, and my friend was just at a conference at Liberty Hawk Ranch, my property in, in Texas, actually God's property, let's a steward, and we had representatives from states at, I bet every state here had a representative there or somebody watching online, and we have 15 states say we're going to put this in to where you can transact in gold and silver and go around the Federal Reserve System. So I've got books out there. You can read it. I'm, I'm going to, for sake of time, I'm going to uh, pass through it, but get a book. I've had a lot of people, if you say, I don't have $10 cash, come get a book. We've had people pay those books forward. I will give you books. I'll give you three or four of the pirate money books. I can't give according to plan because I have an agreement to pay somebody to help me research a piece of it. But I'll give you copies of according to plan because it was paid forward. Last week, we had a, a Texas member of the House of Representatives wrote a $2,500 check and says, give away 250 books to people that can make a difference. We've had a lot of pay it forward, just like Sound of Freedom. Help me with this. Get this message out. Patriot Mobile gave us $5,000 to get books out. So I'm going to Florida. I'm going to walk in with 500 books in Florida and speak to the legislature. With your help, we can take back money from the federal government and bring it back to the states and make it sound money. So I'm going to paraphrase Colonel Crockett. CBDC may go to hell. My gold and silver is going to Texas or Utah or Virginia or Alabama. Bring it on. Let's take back our money. Can I take one more minute? Yeah, and then we want to do questions. Okay, I'm going to take one more minute because people say that sounds impossible. When I started, nobody had ever thought of this or done this anywhere. And I started saying it. And he said, you can't do it. Impossible. Have you seen the movie Darkest Hour? Have you seen the movie Dunkirk? Let me tell you the rest of the story. Paul Harvey were here. He'd tell you the rest of the story. That leaves out King George VI role in it. King George VI, the father of Queen Elizabeth, the grandfather of King Charles, the brother of King Edward. King George VI said, we're about to lose our country. The entire British Expeditionary Force, 350,000 men are trapped in a French beach town. Churchill had a plan, but it would not have worked without what 
King George VI did. He said, we're going to call on the entire empire, every English-speaking part of the world, any freedom-loving part of the world, we're going to beg God to save our empire. And God did three unbelievable distinct miracles. This is recounted in a book, The Trumpet Sounds for Britain by David Gardner. Here's th three things that happened. Number one, Hitler stopped rolling tanks. Some people say he stopped because he's worried the tanks would get dirty in the marshes around Dunkirk. Others say that Hermann Goering, the uh, head of the Luftwaffe of the Air Force, said, no, no, we don't need to take tanks in. We can just bomb them from the air. For whatever reason, he stopped, and I believe God put it on his heart to stop. The second miracle that happened was after one squadron got off from Flanders and strafed one beach, the men dove into the sand knowing they were done for, and they said, something lay on top of us. We think it was angels. And they stood up afterwards, and not one was harmed. And there were bullets lined around them. But all the rest of the planes were stopped. No planes could take off or land in the thick fog that God brought over Flanders. And the third thing that happened is the English Channel became smooth as glass. So the little ships, the small ships, the fishing trawlers, the speedboats, they all were able to make the trek across the channel because the big destroyers couldn't get into the shallow Dunkirk ports. God saved those men, and he did it in answer to prayer. So when they came back, you saw Churchill greeting them, cheering, but he says, wars are never won by retreats. By the way, my property has a, a um, building on it we call the Dunkirk Advance Center rather than the Dunkirk retreat, but the Dunkirk Advance Center, because we want that spirit and we want to advance. Anyway, he said, wars are never won by retreats. The battle for France is over. The battle for Britain is now beginning. We must begin immediate preparations. We will spare not a minute. You know, we'll fight them on the landing grounds. This guy said that. King George VI called him in and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Prime Minister, but no. We're not starting immediately because we have to take Sunday off and give God thanks for what he has done for us. And that, my friends, is when the war was won. The power in this room is enormous. If you will be the little ships carrying pirate money to your legislators, we can win this economic war. You be the little ships. And here's the rule. Number one, pray. Number two, work. And number three, with every victory, let's give thanksgiving. God bless you all.